Welcome to the webinar series, The Year of the Deliverables, specifying receiving the information that your organization needs. This is a webinar series being sponsored jointly by the Campus FM Technology Association, the CFTA, Autodesk, and CAD Microsystems. Today is the first installment in that series called the BIM Deliverables, Why You Need to Have Them. Understand that there are five primary components to the Year of the Deliverable series. We'll start today with the first webcast on why you need to have BIM Deliverable requirements. The second webcast, which will happen on Wednesday, July 11th, will be about BIM Model QC tools. Then at the annual CFTA conference on July 31st in, in, the, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, We'll have two pre-conference sessions. The first pre-conference session will be a deeper dive on the subject we're covering today. The second pre-conference session will be a deeper dive on the subject we will cover on July 11th. And then we will actually be presenting at the conference a session on the Model QAQC process, working with our partners, Ohio State University and Western Michigan University, on how they are taking advantage of BIM deliverable guidelines and model QAQC tools to get the information that they actually need in their process. So why is all of this important to you and why should you care? So over the next 30 minutes, what we plan to cover is what are BIM requirements? I think this is an overused and yet under under uh, misunderstood term, the concept of BIM requirements will we'll help you understand what BIM requirements are. We'll try to talk about why they are great and give you some of the benefits of what we've seen member organizations experience in when they have created and achieved a set of deliverable requirements. We'll talk about the three components. There are essentially three components that as an owner's organization you should be looking at developing for your BIM deliverable requirements. We'll help you identify what those three components are. We'll talk about the concept of level LOD or level of development and how this is important discussion. And then last but not least, we'll help you understand how we're tying this all together with the wonderful work being done by the Campus FM Technology Association and hopefully we'll see all of you at the annual conference. So who has been speaking to you so far? Well, my name is Chuck Meese. I'm a senior manager in the business development team at Autodesk. I like to refer to myself as a recovering architect. Um, and I've been talking about this concept of BIM deliverable guidelines for about 10 years now with Autodesk, working with multiple member owners organizations and especially within the CFTA, where I've been active since two, the conference that was hosted by the University of Southern California in 2008. Um, 33 years of experience spread across architectures and facilities, so I guess I can consider myself a little bit of an old timer. I have the pleasure today of working with someone who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and I'll be turning the webcast over to TJ to go from here on. So TJ Meehan, um, I'd like you to introduce yourself, and then I'll let you take it from there. Thanks, Chuck. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, as Chuck said, I'm TJ. I'm the Vice President of Technology Solutions at CAD Microsystems. Um, I began life as an architect like Chuck, and, uh, and now I spend my time doing consulting for owners um, and the consultants they work with on BIM and COBE and all things related to uh, design, build, and operate. I've been a speaker at many different um, uh, conferences, including CFTA. I didn't even put that on my list there. Um, and then, of course, almost 25 years of experience just in the industry myself. So let's jump in. Um, let's just do a quick, you know, what are BIM requirements um, from your perspective as a higher education owner? Well, I, I think the key here is that a, a set of BIM requirements are, you know, defining what you're asking for from BIM, both as the process of BIM and as the deliverable of BIM, which is typically the models that you're looking for. This is not a set of documents to replace anything you have currently. It is a set of documents to augment what you have currently. Um, so a set of BIM requirements um, is used by both you in-house um, as the manager of the projects, as the, as the owner of the projects, um, and by your in-house teams that are doing design and or construction, but also by your outside AE consultants so that they can follow um, exactly what you're expecting out of them. Um, you know, ultimately, this is your Bible for all that is uh, BIM-related that you're um, working towards. So why are they great? There's a few benefits to BIM requirements. Um, you know, some are pretty obvious, right? So here's a, here's a clearly documented process for you and your teams to follow. 
Um, this is so that people know what they're supposed to deliver when and how they're supposed to do it. Obviously, a big part of BIM requirements are to ensure consistency of deliverables. Um, you know, everyone has heard the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. And it is true back in the CAD days. It, was, it is true now in the BIM days. And um, the, the key here is that we want to make sure that when you are getting deliverables, which are these models, and these models are all really just databases of information, Sure, they have a graphical interface, but the data is really key when it comes to O&M, um, that these are all formatted the same way so that your current systems can either absorb that data or connect right to that data. You know, the third part, the third key benefit, I think, is, you know, so that you are being clear up front with what your goals and desires are for BIM. You know, it, as an implementer of BIM, you need to work towards a goal. You need to work towards what you're going to do with it in short, medium, and long term. We'll talk a little bit about that. But, um, you know, clearly you don't just want to go to one of your consultants and say, give me BIM. They're not going to know what you mean by that. So what are the three key components of a set of BIM requirements? It's, it, there are really three pieces. Um, and the first piece is an overall strategy. This is where you define those goals and objectives. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The BIM requirements document itself is kind of the keystone of all of this. Um, and this is what, um, this is your, your, your central document that everything is built off of. And then your BIM execution plan is what you use on a per project basis. Let's talk about BIM strategy. Um, so this is your roadmap. BIM is a business process change. This is not simply buying a copy of Revit and taking a class. It is much more involved with that. It affects not only you, but it affects the people in your department. It affects the people in the adjacent departments, whether they're in facilities management, or whether they're in um, space planning, or whether they're in operations and maintenance, whether they're in design or construction or whatever. All of these departments are affected by it. And so the key here is to develop a strategy that clearly lays out where you're working towards both short, medium, and long term. This also includes um, laying out how you're going to do that. What are your tactics? What specifically? What specific steps are you going to take moving forward to reach your goals in here? And then this will develop your roadmap. Um, one thing that's not written out on here, but it's also part of this, is metrics. You need a way to measure yourself as you go through here. If I have a 12-month goal, of being able to do clash coordination on, on all my upcoming construction projects, then how am I going to measure that? What am I going to do to make sure that I'm achieving that goal? So those metrics need to be laid out as well, and you need to periodically measure yourself against them. Again, this is a big change, and it requires some change management on your part, and this is the first step in that. So the next part is a BIM requirements document. So BIM requirements document is essentially a contractual document. It does not replace your current design and construction contract or the boilerplate you use for that. You may even have several boilerplates for design and construction, um, but it is uh, an addendum to those contracts. So think of it this way. You're working in a, a standard project. You have this design and construction project. You're working with some outsourced AEs. And you decide that this particular project, you want to follow a BIM process. So your standard contract just says, oh, by the way, this is going to be a BIM project. Refer to the BIM requirements document on what that means. And this document then, as an addendum or as an attachment to your contract, um, will define everything that is in addition to your standard procedure for how you're going to handle BIM. And this is both the steps people will take, both your staff and your consultant, um, as well as the deliverables you're going to expect from it. You know, one of the very first things that you will see in a BIM requirements document is a BIM project kickoff meeting. So that after the, the initial kickoff meeting for the project as a whole, you're going to have um, a BIM kickoff that kind of walks through this document and in the next one on what you're expecting from it. So it, as we go along, we're going to 
uh, certainly open up for questions at the end. If anybody wants to ask a question in the meantime, there's a question panel um, on your GoToWebinar panel there. Um, and feel free to type one in at any time. Um, Chuck and myself will both do our best to answer it right now during the webinar. And if not, we'll get back to you shortly after. So again, with this BIM requirements document, um, there's a, a lot going on in this document. It is your overarching uh, requirements, and it will may not uh, be pertinent on all projects, but all projects will refer back to it. So what I mean by that is, you know, if I'm just doing a small interior renovation, I may not need to read the whole section of my contract about how I expect roofs to be modeled, right? But I do need to define that in my BIM requirements so that other projects that have that can refer back to it. So typically, a BIM requirements document is broken out into these sections. Um, and everyone is different, and every owner should have their own. Uh, I definitely encourage you not to just go download um, another owner's BIM requirements document and expect that to work well for you. Maybe that's your starting point, but they all need to be customized. So you see the very first uh, section in here, general requirements. This is all about uh, laying the foundation. You know, what is this document all about? What are the terms you're going to use in it? Um, what are the roles of people in a BIM process for this? Um, who owns what at the end? That's very important. Um, and you'll notice here, there's the, typically there's a spot in here about existing conditions. You know, this BIM requirements document is not only for new projects um, or renovations or new construction or any of that. It might also be used because you're just going to start to convert some of your portfolio buildings to BIM models. Maybe no design and construction goes on at all. I just need somebody to make a BIM model for me. And this document would, um, would step in for that as well. So submittal requirements is all about kind of those pro project types. So most people have two main project types. So you have a capital um, project type where it's um, new construction or maybe a major renovation. And then you might have an interiors project type where we're moving some walls around, we're renovating the space, we're transitioning people from one location to another. Um, you know, small projects that maybe you do all that design in-house, maybe even do some of the construction in-house. Um, most owners have kind of a threshold on when they, uh, on where they would make the break between those kind of interiors capital design projects. Some owners have other types of projects, and we work with owners where they break their projects up based on the funding um, because they might be a government type entity and they get um, funding from the government for it. That's fine. The key here is that the submittal requirements section is where you define those project types and what you're going to do from a BIM standpoint for each of those project types. What will be your, um, maybe the extra meetings that you want to have, the extra submissions, um, who's going to be in charge of what, um, and, and LOD requirements. We'll talk about LOD a little bit more here in a second. So the third section here is, is modeling requirements. This is the meat of a BIM requirements. This is where you're saying, all right, our, most of our deliverables in a, in a BIM process include a model, um, hopefully a Revit model. And what does that model need to look like? How should it be formatted? What data should be in it? How should the graphics look in it? And that is where your modeling requirements um, section comes into play. One key thing here that you will not find in most uh, BIM requirements that you would download or that you would grab from other owners is this middle part, this modeling standards. So certainly almost every BIM requirements out there talks about the actual building elements, the walls, doors, windows, mechanical equipment, electrical fixtures, and so on that you want in the model. But the model as a whole as a database also needs some requirements built into it. So you want to make sure that people are, um, you know, for example, they are, when they do a final submission of the model, you don't want demo in that model because you're going to use this model for moving forward for renovation projects. And so there, you're going to have some standards in here about that, maybe naming of the views or um, how you want your browser organized or things like that. So additional BIM tasks. Back in the general requirements and submittal requirements, you call out that every BIM project is going to um, deliver typically two things, is what most owners do, and that is a clash coordination effort 
during construction to make sure that everyone is coordinated by utilizing the models. And secondly, many owners um, require some sort of operations and maintenance data deliverable. Usually that's in a COBE format, doesn't need to be. Um, and those are typically the two requirements that happen on all BIM projects, no matter what type of project. But every project is unique. And so the additional BIM task section is, is where you would define what other types of BIM tasks would you want on a per project basis. So this could include you know, 4D, 5D, 6D, 7D, um, which are kind of loosely uh, industry terms. I'm, I'm not a big fan of calling them out that way. But uh, you know, it could be that you're going to do construction sequencing, or that you want a bill of materials take off, um, or that you're going to do lead for it, you know, things like that. And then, of course, the appendices is where you put in all the big tables that are long. So we have a question in here. I want to try and reference here really quick. Uh, the question is, what do you mean by a BIM model? Are you referring to BIM as building information model or building information management? So adding model makes sense. Um, and then there's a question about IFC. So when I say model, I refer to a specific um, building information model generated in a building information modeling program like Revit or Bentley BIM or Archicad or something like that. Um, that's what I refer to. I'm not talking about building information management. That is more along the process lines of, of, of the BIM process. Um, as far as IFC, industry foundation classes, that is a, a generic format for BIM um, so that you can exchange a, across uh, lots of different organizations and lots of different software. I'll address that a little bit more in a little bit. Okay, that's the, that's the end of BIM requirements. The next key piece, uh, the third piece here, is all about the BIM execution plan. So where is the BIM requirements is the overarching document that defines everything you could possibly do with a BIM process. Um, the BIM execution plan is your project-specific document. So every project that you decide to do a BIM process on, you will have a BIM execution plan that defines the who, what, when, and how on that particular project. Who's involved, who are your stakeholders, who are your points of contact from the BIM side, and typically each person, each stakeholder involved in the project will have a, um, either a BIM coordinator or a BIM manager that's involved there. Um, you know, what are you modeling? Who's, who gets to model what? Um, uh, when are you submitting these models? And, you know, to what LOD? So what is the level of detail that you want in these models? Um, I said level of detail. You can uh, check my age, my BIM age there. Um, that's what it used to be called. Level of development is what we refer to it now. Level of details typically when people are only talking about graphics. And level of development is when you're talking about the graphics and the data. How does it look and what data is tied to it? So a BIM execution plan is typically an Excel spreadsheet for the most part. Sometimes people will do it in a Word document, but typically it's um, mainly tables. Um, and those tables are you know, called element ownership tables. They're essentially tables listing all the things that would be in a model, um, all the building elements, um, again, the walls, the mechanical equipment, the fixtures, things like that. And then in that table, it'll call out at each submission what should be the LOD. Should it be very low resolution? Should it be very high resolution? Should it have a low amount of data? Should it have a high amount of data? And that, sh that would be called out in these tables. Um, so the upfront sanctions, obviously, are the, you know, kind of the, the project information, key contacts, and, and where they sit in the organization. You may restate your BIM goals and objectives. You may have specific goals and objectives just for this particular project, uh, let's say. And then um, you can uh, define your procedures. So how are you going to exchange data? Where? Are you going to use Dropbox? Do you have a file share somewhere else? Something like that. And then you get into the, the LOD requirements. And those are your element ownership tables. That would be the fourth tab. Um, QC procedures, it's nice to have your QC checklist inside there so that people can review and submit a checklist saying, yes, I'm submitting this model. I went through the checklist and just double check that everything is correct per the requirements. And here it is for you. 
Um, the model structure, so often there are multiple models, and you want to make sure that you have, um, that you're laying out what are the different models, how are they connected to each other, who's responsible for what model, and so on. So let's talk a little bit more about LOD. Um, LOD, again, is where you define both the graphics and the data. And you'll actually see here on the right that here's a picture straight out of the BIM forums level of development specification. That is probably the most thorough publicly available spec that you can find. Um, a lot of time has been spent on that. And the BIM forum is um, uh, made up of both the AIA and the AGC. They get together and they um, with BIM forum and they develop this specification. It's, it's excellent. They've done a lot of work on it. Um, and as you can see here that there's a, a very clear relationship with the graphics starting from the top being very low detail all the way down to very high detail. On the, on the left, um, that's essentially data points and as they build downwards. And then you'll see in the far left, the 100, 200, 300, there's a 350 shoved in there and then a 400. So the United States does not have a standard specification on LOD. There are multiple LOD specifications out there. This is one of them. It's probably the most complete one. Um, the UK, on the other hand, does have a standard defined specification for this. So in the US, we tend to build our own. Most people follow this system of numbering it from 100 to 500, and you will sometimes see 250, 350, and even 450 shoved in between some of those steps. That is probably the inherent problem with the um, with the kind of uh, unformal US system that we have right now, is that most of these show the graphics and data in a linear relationship. So as the graphics get more um, detailed, there becomes more data on that, on that object. Um, that's not really, in reality, how things work. So let's talk about that a little bit. Down along the bottom here, I have um, just kind of a graph of kind of the design and, um, and construction operation process. So in design, I've broken up into schematic and design development, and then we have construction and we have operations. And what you'll notice here is that the needs for graphics versus data in a BIM process change as we work through the project. You know, I need a lot of graphics during schematic design because I'm trying to sell the vision. I'm trying to understand this design um, and, and make sure that it is correct. I don't need a lot of data. I don't need to know model and manufacturer and even costs. I can have ranges costs. As we get into design development, we start to refine the graphics. We start to increase the data. When we get to construction, I need lots of graphics because I have means and methods I have to follow. And my data continues to increase. But when I get to operations, and this is usually the problem that people have, I don't need a lot of graphics. For an air handling unit, I just need a big box. And in that case, I just need that box with the data on it. The problem that owners often face is that they get these models that are huge. They have so much graphics in them that have been built up over the process of design and construction that when they're handed over, they may or may not have the data they need, but more importantly, they almost always have more graphics than they need. As you see, graph data is ever increasing throughout this process. You need a lot of data to operate a facility. You need preventative maintenance schedules. You need model and serial numbers. You need, um, uh, you know, diagrams. You need warranty information. All of that is critical to operate a facility, but I don't need a lot of graphics. So the point I'm trying to make is that most of these publicly available LOD specifications, as nice and detailed as they are, they do not separate the data and graphics, and therein can lie a um, lies a dilemma for you as an owner um, of getting too much graphics for what you need. All right, that was a lot to absorb um, and a lot to talk about. So um, if anybody has any questions, please add them to the questions panel. Um, if we can't answer them now, we will certainly get back to you. TJ, I have, a, I, have, I have one that's come in as well as I'd like to go back and address the question that was brought up about IFC. Um, I, I'd like to give my thoughts on that. I have a very specific yeah. uh, thought around IFC. I think in any 
deliverable guideline, you should always ask for an IFC format in addition to a, a native file, for instance, a Revit file. And the reason why I feel you should ask for an IFC deliverable is purely for the uh, this, from the standpoint that IFC is an ISO certified file format guaranteed to have machine readability at some time in the future, whereas even though we've provided to the best of our abilities forward readability within the Revit platform, you know, there's nothing to guarantee that that should something couldn't happen at some point in the future. Um, so ISO um, has certified the, the uh, IFC file format, so it provides you a great archiving format and a guarantee of machine readability downstream. So I always recommend to owners that they at least you know, ask for a native file as well as ask for an IFC-based deliverable. So any, anything to add on that, TJ? Yeah, I would say an IFC is a great way to do a snapshot in time of something. Yep. So at particular submissions, that is an excellent format to use for that. Um, the, you know, of course, IFC can be difficult to use um, to pull it back into an authoring software and then utilize going forward. You know, anytime you translate data, you, there's possibility for data loss. Um, so that's where the native format comes in really helpful. Um, I, I would just say that no matter what, as an owner, you should stick with one authoring tool and request um, the files in that particular authoring tool and the IFC as the, as the backup with it. Yeah, I, I agree. That's something very similar. Uh, TJ, I have one question here that I think you, you've done a lot of these BIM deliverable guidelines. What are some of the lessons that you've seen owners learn uh, and or maybe even mistakes that you've seen uh, owners uh, go through in, in this process? Sure. So a couple, couple things I would point out. Um, Often in BIM requirements, owners do not um, spell out what they don't want modeled. And let me elaborate on that. Um, if I request an LOD 300 door as my final submission for a deliverable, and that door typically shows the panel um, and the, which way it swings and maybe the frame around it, um, what ends up happening is that the designers will download um, a door that is that and more. And they may go grab a door that even has all the hardware modeled on it and has all these different options built into the parametrics of the doors that I could swap it out with a totally different type of door. Of course, all that does is cause model bloat. Um, as an owner, I do not need the hardware modeled on a door. I don't need to see where the doorknob is. I just need a field of data on that door to know what the hardware set is um, that references back to the hardware schedule. So. Um, that's one key thing that, that we see all the time. The second thing we see, and this is um, happens constantly, is uh, what I'm going to call data bloat. And so I can certainly go download. Uh, many, many manufacturers have their content created in Revit. But one manufacturer, for example, might call it AMPS. And the next manufacturer might call it AMPRIDGE. And the next manufacturer might just call it AMP in all capitals or whatever. The point is that they're not consistent with each other. Um, and so as you start to import all of that data into your model, all of a sudden I have three different fields of data to look up the amperage of my electrical equipment. So you want to be very clear about what data fields, in the case of Revit, those are parameters that you want to use um, inside your models to make sure that um, you're getting consistency and that you can do takeoffs across them. And, and TJ, I'll let you look at the QA panel. There's a there's a question in there I'd like you to adjust, but I'd like to give my thoughts on that. Um, I've worked with over 100 owners' organizations, and I think the biggest mistake and or lesson learned that I've seen is letting what, what I refer to as letting the perfect become the enemy of the good enough. Um, I have one particular organization that I have worked with for the last three years to develop a set of BIM deliverable requirements. They're still arguing over the perfect set of BIM deliverable requirements. And in the last three years, they've done almost $300 million of capital construction with no BIM deliverable requirements. And the point I'm trying to make is, if you understand that your BIM documentation is a living, breathing document, and you start somewhere, maybe even in a simplistic fashion, understanding that you're going to build upon that, you will still be way further ahead than if you have that you know, analysis paralysis argument of trying to create the perfect set of guidelines on the way out. 
Um, even some of the organizations that are members of the CFTA that I feel have great BIM deliverable guidelines. I'll use Ohio State now. I'll, I'll single Joe and the team at Ohio State out. They just released the third revision of their guidelines. So even after what I consider is a great set of guidelines, they've acknowledged the fact that those have ebbed and flowed over time and just released the third ref. So I think my biggest lesson learned is start somewhere and, and then understand you're going to, to live and breathe these documents over time. Very good, uh, Chuck. I want to I want to I want to address two questions that come up. Um, okay. So one is by Eric Banham. Um, maybe that's Barham. Uh, sorry, Eric, if I butchered your last name. But his question was: All right, owners need BIM requirements, but what about the consultants? Is it worth consultants building their own set of BIM requirements um, instead of just following the owners? And what I would say to all of you on 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 this webinar that are consultants to owners is that you certainly want your own set of BIM requirements for when the owners either don't exist or they are have a lot of gaps in them. And that way when the owner comes to you and says, hey, here's my BIM requirements, and you look at it and go, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? Where are these holes? Um, in your contract, you can say, hey, where there's not clarity from the owner, we will follow our published BIM requirements to fill in the gaps for that. But also having your own BIM requirements for internally to make sure that even if you're not working with an owner who has been savvy, but you you might still be doing Revit models and delivering DWG files, that's fine, um, but you want it for your own internal QAQC to make sure that um, your teams, uh, your young designers are actually modeling to the standards that you expect out of your firm. Um, one other one I want to address too, um, from Deke Smith, this is a very good point. I didn't stress this enough. He is spot on with this. In general, I'm going to generalize a lot here, but in general, design is about 1% of the total cost of a building over its life cycle. Construction is about 9%, and operations is about 90%. Um, that puts a lot of things in perspective. In BIM, we talk a lot about design and construction, but operations is 90% of the total building life cycle. The reason it's so important to have strong LOD requirements and to make sure that your models are at a state at final delivery um, that you can reuse is because those are going to be your backgrounds for all your future projects and they're probably going to be your master files for all of your space planning internally. So if you get a giant bloated model that you can't do anything with, sure maybe that design and construction project went off great and they followed a BIM process, but that final deliverable is now not usable, and you got to start over at your next job. So I think it's very important to make sure that um, throughout, and this will be one of your goals in your BIM strategy, is that you are shooting towards reusable models so that you can continue to do all your renovation work and capital projects in these facilities for the next 30 years. And, and I agree, TJ. As, as you know, when when you've heard me speak on this, I, I always talk about the idea of begin with the end in mind. If you, and and with the end being the life cycle management of the facility, uh, and and I think one of the other, I'll go back to the previous question about what are some of the mistakes we've seen owners make. Uh, I would say it's not involving the facilities people deeply enough in the development of their BIM guidelines. Uh, that led to the you know the little anecdotal story you told uh, earlier, TJ, about you know not having a capturing a lot of data that no one needs and not capturing the 8 or 10 or 12 fields of data that the person who's maintaining the air handler needs. So I think that would be another thing to add to this is really focus on getting that facilities involvement. And, and we'll actually go much deeper into that uh, at the CFDA conference. So I'm going to wrap up with the last couple things. I know we're a couple minutes over. Um, yep. We are recording this session, and it will be available. Um, should be. I think uh, Allison is on the line from our team, and she's um, the one who manages that, and she'll be sending out an email with a link to that. Um, and TJ will also be requiring or, or providing the recording to the CFTA to be posted as a right. part of their webinar series on YouTube. Yep, and we'll PDF the slides, too, to make them available as well. Um, and the last little one uh, was about uh, asking more detail about a QC checklist. What would that look like? And that is a perfect segue, actually, to the next 
uh, webinar where we're going to actually talk about QC tools and, and, and go into what QCing would look like for models and for uh, BIM deliverables. So I'm going to leave it at that for that one. So um, TJ, that, th that webinar so is on July 11th. Yep, and I think our, our next slide, we're going to talk about the conference. Yep, so yeah, remind excellent. you all, Thank you. right, we have the CFTA conference coming up um, uh, at the end of July, beginning of August. I, I, I've been involved in every conference since 2008. Uh, I cannot tell you how much I learn at each of these conferences from the ability to talk to peers, to talk to other people. It's, it's just a fabulous opportunity to network. Uh, it's being hosted by The Ohio State University this year, a great opportunity for you to be with your peers. As we mentioned in the introduction of the series, we're also going to be doing some deeper dives um, on the pre-conference session on July 31st. So what we covered here very simply in 30 minutes, we'll do a full 90 minutes. We'll actually get into examples of BIM deliverable guidelines and, and some of the things that we what we've covered just at a, at a very superficial level in this conversation. So a much deeper guideline there. Uh, the next webinar, as TJ mentioned, will happen on July 11th. We'll cover the BIM model QC tools. Uh, we'll introduce you to something called the BIM interoperability tools, which is an investment that Autodesk has made in the interoperability community uh, to provide tools uh, free of charge to the owners and the consultants working with those owners to help now that you have a set of guidelines, is the model actually meeting the guidelines and, and do so uh, in removing what I call the punitive workflows, right? So if we have tools that allow us to understand in real time where we're at against a set of guidelines, we eliminate the deliver a model to the owner, have the model critique the owner, and then this back and forth, what I call the punitive response. Uh, so we'll work on that. Again, I mentioned then we'll lead up to the pre-conference sessions on July 31st um, at the CFDA conference. And TJ, I think if you jump back down to the end, we just have a, a bit of information to wrap up with. There we uh, go. So contact information for both TJ and I, feel free to email us. We're more than happy to take, uh, to take any of your questions offline, provide you additional information, and we will look forward to seeing you all on July 11th and or at the CFTA conference in Columbus, Ohio, starting July 31st. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody.